All right, the title of the sermon this morning is Tithing versus Giving. Tithing versus Giving. So this sermon, the purpose of this sermon is not so much to encourage you guys to give. Obviously, I encourage you guys to give and all that sort of thing. Uh, the purpose of this sermon this morning is really to teach you the difference between tithing in the Old Testament and giving in the New Testament and how they differ because some people believe tithing still applies in the New Testament and when they give it to church, is that tithing? Uh, what really is tithing? So I want to talk about this today and just go through the passages um, so you can understand what is the difference and how does it differ from what they did in the Old Testament to what is expected of the Christian today. All right? So a bit more of a doctrinal sermon today. Tithing versus giving. So first of all, what is the tithe? Now, if you ask probably your common Christian, you know, just your everyday Christian, and ask what is tithing, they will think that that's giving 10% of my, you know, post-tax income or whatever, my, my taxable income, like the way they work it out, whatever, after tax, you take your taxable income, take away tax, and then you give 10% of that to the church that you attend, right? That's what most people will think tithing is. Um, but what is tithing? And we'll, we'll look at a few passages today, uh, particularly what uh, is described in the Old Testament. Now, it's not too far off, right? There's some elements of truth to what they're talking about, because obviously a tithe is a tenth, right? So we'll start in Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. So that's how we know a tithe equals a tenth, right? You'll see tithe and tenth is kind of used interchangeably in the Bible when talking about the tithe. So when you tithe, you're giving a tenth of something. But then when we talk about the law of the tithe, we're talking about what was actually commanded of them. So if somebody says, well, I'm giving 10% of my income, you know, we can say technically that's tithing because they're giving a tenth of something. But I'm not using the word tithe in that instance when I'm talking about tithing today. I'm talking about what was commanded in the Old Testament as opposed to what's commanded and practiced in the New Testament. Right, so a tithe is when you give a tenth. So you can see here, as we're reading in Leviticus 27, you see one scenario when you know where they're growing things in the land, and like you know, you grow ten, you know, bushels of something, then one tenth of that should be the is the Lord's. And it's the same with the herd. If you give birth to like ten new cows or something, then one of those cows actually belongs to God, doesn't actually belong to you. That's uh, what this tenth is. Verse 33: He shall not search whether it be good. Or bad. So you see, you can't like have 10 cows and then you go, hmm, this one's like, you know, missing a foot and a bit sick and you know, I don't like the color of it or whatnot. And that's the one I give to God. Because that's how some people give, right? Some people give where they go, hmm, what's the one I don't want? And that's the one I'm going to give to God. Right? Where well, he's saying, no, you can't search whether it's good or bad. Neither shall he change it. If he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy, it shall be redeemed. And even when we read through sort of uh, Numbers 18 before, you'll see that they, they, they should actually give the best to God, right? So the one that's the best. But here the tithe was just, it was the first, right? The first tenth that was given to God and then the other nine was for the, the people, uh, the person. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Now notice here, or it says here in verse 30, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. So notice that a tithe is not actually in the Old Testament. It wasn't actually people giving to God. It was actually God's already. And if they did not give the tithe, they were actually stealing from God. Right? So that's how the tithe worked back then. That's why when, when we read, and we read this last week when we talked about blessings and cursings, in Malachi 3, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Right? So because the tithe was the Lord's, when they actually refrained from paying that tithe to the temple back then, and we'll see different ways the tithe was used because they actually participated in eating those tithes as well. So it's something they gave to God, but at the same time they enjoyed it with the priests and with the people in their city and whatnot. It's this saying that because it doesn't even belong to you to begin with, that if you refrain from paying it, you're actually stealing from God. That's why it talks about the tithe that way, because it's the Lord's. 
And obviously when we talked about last week, the blessing and the cursing, it's different to the New Testament, reaping, sowing, chastisement and rewards. It says, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. So there was obviously a blessing and a cursing associated in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant with the tithes. And, and as I mentioned last week, unfortunately a lot of churches use this passage to encourage people to tithe. I don't think this should be the motivation, nor do I think it's doctrinally correct that you will be cursed if you don't tithe because the curse is no longer in effect for believers in the New Testament, right? Jesus was made a curse for us. And, and the funny thing is when you hear churches kind of use this passage to say, well, you'll be cursed if you don't tithe, generally fundamental churches will not preach the opposite where they say, if you tithe, then you're going to be blessed like this says, right? Because they don't want to be accused of preaching a prosperity gospel. And this is where the prosperity gospel gets its sort of foundation from, these sort of passages where they say, well, if you give and you're obedient, therefore God's going to bless you and you're going to be healthy, wealthy and wise, which is not the case. It's not how it works. The old covenant cannot be kept by anyone. Right? You need it to be perfect in order to keep that old covenant. So there's a spiritual application to this blessing and cursing. Now, because the tithe is the Lord's, that's why you would be robbing God if you refrain from paying the tithe. That's not so the case when it comes to giving in the New Testament. Numbers 18. We'll go to this passage uh, that we read. Uh, just let me... Just one second... I wanted to go to Deuteronomy before we go to Numbers, but I just had this first in my notes. Let me just change that here. Deuteronomy 14. We'll see here um, different ways that the tithe was given in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy coin, and of thy wine, and of thine oil, and of the firstlings of thy herd, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So you see how they collected the tenth of all their increase, and they brought it to the tabernacle, or to the temple, once every year. And then when they went there, they'd actually have a feast, and they would eat together, and they would partake in those tithes too. Verse 24, and if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. And the Levite, Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. And we'll see that a bit later in Numbers when we go there. So you'll see here, he's saying, so you collect your tithe, you bring it to the tabernacle once, you know, every year, year by year. And he's saying if the way, if it's too far to travel for you to carry all those tithes, what you can do is you can convert it into money. You can convert it into gold and silver. You can bring the gold and silver with you. And then when you arrive there, then you can buy whatever you desire. Right? You can, and he lists a whole bunch of things. Because what's the idea? You go there, you convert it back into sheep and oxen or whatever, and then you also partake in that feast that is there. And then the rest, obviously, is, is for the Levites and for the priests. What's interesting here in Deuteronomy 14, verse 28, that every three years it's slightly different, right? At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year and shalt lay it up within thy gates. So you notice it's two years where they're bringing it to the tabernacle and the temple, but on the third year they actually keep it within their city, right? The gates of where they live. And they actually share it together with the town rather than bringing it to the tabernacle and the temple. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, 
which are within thy gates shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. So you can see year by year is a little bit different. One year, tabernacle, second year, tabernacle, third year, hey, they share it amongst themselves and the widow, the fatherless, the stranger can enjoy with them. Right? So this is how the tithe was utilized. Now let's go to Numbers 18 and we'll just go through uh, how the tithe was established and why it's, why it's there. Right? Verse 20. It says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. So if you remember when they went into the promised land, the first thing God took like every, you know, every man that was sanctified, you know, broke the matrix, you know, the, the matrix when they're born, and then every animal that was born, the first was always given to God. And then there was a change where he said, okay, now rather than sanctifying and setting apart the first, he's going to set apart the tribe of Levi, and Levi will be set apart, and all that sort of thing. So when they went into the promised land, and after the wars and everything, and then they were divvying up the land, that was their inheritance. It was the land that they inherited that God had given to them, taken from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and all those other ites that are in the land. Now, obviously, they didn't drive them all out, but you know, now they had gained control of this land, and, and they, it was divvied up amongst the nations, uh, amongst the, the, the tribes. Now, Levi did not get any land, right? They were set apart to do God's work. So they didn't, weren't given land to raise cattle and do farming and all that. They were going to do the work of the temple. And in order to fund that work, the tithe was established where all the other 11 tribes would pay one-tenth to the tribe of Levi, right? And that's why the, the tithe was established. And you notice, it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, 11 tribes are giving 10%. You'd think like nine tribes give 10%, but it's 11. So I don't know if, you know, that works out a little bit more, you know, for that one tribe because they're getting 10% from a, 11 tribes rather than 10% from nine tribes. Verse 21, And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh the tabernacle of the congregation, lest they bear sin. So you can see how there's a change here, who is, you know, sort of doing the work within the tabernacle and whatnot. It's like now the rest of the children of Israel can't come nigh in the tabernacle. It's the Levites and the priests now. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. So this is where we're being taught. Hey, this is why the tithe existed. It was for the Levites to pay for the Levite tribe who didn't get an inheritance, and it was for their service in the work of the tabernacle. And if you know your Bible, you'll know that you know Levi had three sons, and it was the, 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 the responsibilities were like divvied up between those three sons. And Aaron, who is a Levite, right? Aaron's line and descendants, they were the priests. Right? So not every Levite was a priest. Right, so the priests, they could be the high priest, they did certain things in the tabernacle. The Levites were kind of like the other workers that you know, set up the tabernacle, broke down the tabernacle, they carried it as they went and, and whatnot. So you have the 12 tribes, one tribe is the Levite tribe, Aaron and Moses were Levites, but Aaron was chosen to be the priest and his descendants were the priests. Right? Numbers 18 verse 25, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, when ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them for your inheritance, so remember the tithe is the Lord's, he's given it to the tribe of, of the Levites, then ye shall offer up and heave offering of it for the Lord even a tenth part of the tithe. So notice how a tenth was given to the tribe of Levi, but even the Levites, when they received their reward, they then, excuse me, offered a tenth to God. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness 
of the wine press. So he's saying, you know, you don't have inheritance. You're not raising, you know, cattle and sheep and oxen and whatnot. You're not, you know, growing, you know, corn and, and olive trees and all that sort of stuff. But when you do the work of the Lord, when you get and you're giving a tenth because you're getting paid that tithe, you're giving a tenth because the reward for your service is as though you were, you know, you know, doing the corn, you know, corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press. So he's saying even though you don't necessarily do those functions, the money that you are getting paid or the tithe that you're getting paid still counts as you know, revenue for your services. Thus he also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel. And ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best thereof. So notice that it wasn't, you know, generally when we give to God, you know, we give to God the things that we don't want. You know, that's, that shouldn't be our attitude when we give to God. The attitude when we give to God should be that we give the best. You know, it should cost us something. You know, I don't even remember the story of David when he wanted to give something to the Lord and, and somebody, you know, the, one, the person he was buying the land off just said, oh, you know, just take what you need, you know. And he says, no, I'm not going to give something to God that doesn't cost me anything. Because you're not really giving to God. It doesn't cost you anything. Right? Somebody gives you something and then you pass it on. You didn't actually give anything to God. So it needs to cost us something. And it needs to be the best. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, When ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress. And ye shall eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. And ye shall bear no sin by reason of it when ye have heaved from it the best of it. Neither shall ye pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest ye die. Now when I was reading through this passage, I was thinking, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't actually know if the priests then tithed on the tithe of the Levites. <laughs> so if you have that answer, I'm not too sure myself. But the tribes tithe, gave to the tribe of Levi... Levites tithe, and that was given to the priests, and I'm not sure whether the priests also tithe. Maybe it gets to redundant at that point because they're obviously using the tithe um, for their pay anyway. So, the tithe was given to the Levites in place of the land for a production. It was a tenth. That's what a tithe is. And the tithe was compulsory. It's not a voluntary offering. There were also other compulsory offerings and other voluntary offerings as well. And this was on top of the tithe uh, that were under the Levitical priesthood. And the main purpose of the tithe was to fund the Levitical priesthood. So what is this tithe in the nation of Israel? If you think about it, the tithe was the tax in Israel, wasn't it? It's just like we have taxes today that pay for our ministers and pay for our bloated government and all the programs that government shouldn't do and all these sorts of things. They paid a tenth and that was the tax in Israel. Now, was it a tax, um, you know, what, what was it taxed on? Because, you know, people sometimes, we talk about, you know, and it's June now and tax time is coming up upon us. Um, how these taxes work. A lot of people have different ideas and different theories on how, you know, if God wants to have a taxation system, how should it work? Now, the way I think it worked in the nation of Israel is it was a 10% tax or a tithe on all revenue, right? Not, not profit, right? So the difference between re revenue, if you guys know revenue is just how much you take in, but profit is after you take away your expenses. But the reason why I think it's 10% on all revenue is because if you think, it just says of everything that passes under the rod, of everything that gets grown in the field. So God's not saying, okay, it's a tenth of what you grew in the field, but you know, take away your expense for like your, tra you know, your tractors, your plowshares, you know, all those sorts of things. How much did it cost you to build the barn and everything? He just says, no, 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 you tithe on everything that gets brought up in the field, right? Uh, and, every, and, and even tenth of the animals. So the way I think this worked is it was like a 10% tax on revenue, right? But no deductions. And I think if Australia followed that model, it would be so good. I mean, because a lot of people don't realize how much taxes they pay. You say, well, I, mean, I pay my income tax. And maybe you're in like the 30% bracket, 32% bracket, or is it 37? And then it, I don't know what it goes up to. I've never, I've never gotten that high in my own income. But, you know, what is it, like 40-something percent? 
And you think like, I'm paying 32% tax. But that's not true because that's just 32% of your taxable income. But you're not taking into account sales tax as well. And you know, when you buy stuff and you've got like your GST, that's another tax. So add that to the tax bill. And then you've got like all these other excises and then they, they add taxes to try and control people's behavior. So I think cigarettes is literally like 40 something percent. There's tax on fuel, there's tax on... I mean, if you knew all the taxes on all the things you paid for, you'd be like, you'd get angry. And you ought to get angry because there are countries that have gone to war for like way less taxes than we buy. And people say like, oh, God asking for 10%, that's too much. Man, if we had this tithing system in Australia, we'd be way better off. You know, you just pay so much less tax, 10%, even if, it was, even if there was no deductions. You know, if you know a bit, I'm, I'm getting a bit off topic here, but it's, it's still on topic because it's to do with the time. But people have different theories on, you know, what's the best tax system a country should have, right? And, and people say, uh, you know, consumption taxes versus income taxes. So income taxes is like money you make and do you pay taxes on that? Consumption taxes is only when you spend money. So GST is a consumption tax. Some people believe you should only have a consumption tax, right? So when you spend, that's when you pay your taxes. Some people believe, no, it should be an income tax. I believe it should be an income tax, right? Because that's how God has it. And I think it makes it a bit more fair because let's say somebody had millions and millions and millions of dollars, but they spent as much as a poor person then they'd be paying the same amount of tax, right? They had the same lifestyle. So a, con a consumption tax is relative to how much you spend. But income tax seems a bit more fair because if you make more money, then you contribute more to society. You contribute more to that thing. So everyone pays the same percentage. Whereas if it's a consumption tax, then poor people are going to be paying a higher percentage of their income than people with more income. So I think it should be an income tax. Um, but it should be 10% of revenue, no deductions. And you think like, oh, that's not fair if you can't get rid of any deduct, but it'd be so much better off because you know the reason why like, the tax code is like so complex? It's because of all the edu deductions. Like why, why do people need an accountant and this? Because they're trying to figure out how to like, reduce this and this deduction, this, this loophole and that loophole. And you know what? If, in, in a country, if you just got rid of all those loopholes and just said no deductions, just 10% of... You know, it's one figure, you brought in this much, 10% of that, that's done. You can get rid of this whole industry of like accountants and bookkeepers and just like all these people that have to keep up all these keeping up with all the laws and all the tax laws and all that, all, and even all the bureaucracy in government, we'd be better off. You know, so that's why some people think flat tax is fair and get rid of all the deduct, get rid of all the complexity, get rid of all the waste. You know, that happens in our country. So but there's definitely benefits of simplifying the taxes. That's what the tithe is. So the tithe is the tax in Israel. And it would be on revenue. Now some people try and use the tithe to calculate, oh, how much should I give today? And you know, I don't think you should calculate it that way because like I said, this is the tax. We're already paying like maybe 30, 40, 50%. So it's like you, you don't necessarily calculate your giving based on the revenue because, you know, some people, that, that'll bring them under the poverty line. They, they might not even have enough to make ends meet, right? So you wouldn't calculate 10% on, on revenue and um, giving in the New Testament is not even done that way anyway, but 10% on revenue, no tax. Now, is there tithing in the New Testament? Let's move on. So that's what the tithe is. Hopefully that gives you an idea. Um, oh, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention as well, because this question came up when we were uh, talking amongst uh, the guys with tithing, is what is actually tithed on? Because in the Old Testament, when they talked about the tithe, you'll notice that it said the tithe of the land and the tithe of the herd, right? So it's like when the land, you know, br brings forth fruit, the herd, you know, brings forth cattle and whatnot. And some people have this idea, which I don't agree with, that the only thing that is tithe is on primary industry. So it's like things that you bring out of the ground, things that grow animals. Which, which wouldn't make sense because that means if you are somebody that works in a secondary industry, like maybe you make clothing or maybe you take metal that is mined and you make equipment and whatnot, do you not have to pay taxes on your income that you create? Should you not contribute to that you know, Levit Levitical priesthood and to the government of the society. So where I think we can get a precedent for, you know, somebody who doesn't necessarily work in a primary industry, but should still tithe under the Old Testament tithe, 
is when we look at the Levites, because remember the Levites were doing the work of the tabernacle, and God said to them, even though you're getting paid this tithe, you know, and, and it's doing for the work of the servant of the tabernacle, it was as if you were working in the field. So I think we can take that principle, and I think it would be, you know, obviously fair for everyone in the nation of Israel, not only those that participate in primary industry, to partake in this tithe tax that ran the nation of Israel and contributed to uh, the Levites. That's just my thoughts there. Obviously, different people have different thoughts. All right, second point is no tithing in the New Testament. Now, before people that are a little bit more tight fisted go, yes, you know, it's more for me, I don't have to give her anything. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, obviously, there is giving in the New Testament, but it's not tithing in the sense the way it is done in the Old Testament. Right? Remember, 10% of your revenue brought to the tabernacle, it's for the priests, and all that sort of thing. There are similarities, and we'll talk to that in a moment. But technically, the law of the tithe is no longer there. It was there to fund the Levitical priesthood. Now, Jesus does mention tithing in the New Testament. Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other under. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So now you know what Jesus was referring to. We've all heard the saying, straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. He says it in regards to the Pharisees and their tithing. This is not Jesus speaking negatively of tithing. You know, this is saying this is something they did. But he's just saying that they were very focused on getting the tithe right, that they would even tithe on mint. You know, you think about these little herbs, anise and cumin, that make sure they count exactly a tenth of these small herbs, and yet they would leave these large things, more important things, undone. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Now, like we talked about last week and like I've taught before, just because you're reading a New Testament book, that doesn't mean it's a New Testament period, right? Because the New Testament doesn't start until Jesus dies and rises again. So yes, as Jesus walked the earth, he did talk about tithing. He talked about Sabbath keeping. He talked about offering things at the temple and whatnot. But that doesn't mean it still applies today because the new covenant is now in effect. Now, how do we know this? Well, if you read through Hebrews, this Hebrews is what is explaining, you know, why things have changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. A lot of uh, the, wor the world will, you know, accuse Christians of just cherry-picking what laws they want to keep and what laws they don't want to keep. But no, the Bible actually teaches why specific laws have been done away with because they were to do with the old covenant, the Levitical priesthood, and all the service of the tabernacle. A lot of those clean and unclean laws uh, were to do with you know, making sure you were clean and unclean to be able to go into the tabernacle, and they were no, no longer in effect today. Well, let's read from Hebrews 7, verse 5. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So this is talking about Melchizedek, which is the priest that Jesus Christ is descended after. So Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He did not descend from the Levitical tribe. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore for perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So Hebrews, you have to re read back, but it's, 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 a, it's a, quite a complex book, but it's just trying to compare Jesus to the Levitical priesthood, saying, you know, if we could get perfect by these carnal ordinances and these ceremonial laws, then why did Jesus have to be a priest 
after the order of Melchizedek, and they knew that from the Psalms, right? Because when David wrote the Psalms, he says, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he's saying, why is there a need for another priest to come after this priesthood if the Levitical priesthood made us perfect? So Paul is making the argument here that the Levitical priesthood and these carnal ordinances don't make us perfect, right, to the Jews. For, uh, Hebrews 7 verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So you can see how the priesthood changed, and this is why there's a change in the New Testament. Now, what was the tithe for? The tithe was there to pay for these things that no longer exist, right? And it was a tax. We're not under the nation of Israel anymore. We don't have God and the judges governing our country. We have Australia and, you know, its forces governing our country. We pay taxes to that nation as opposed to paying a tithe to God nations, if you were, God's na nation if you were living under the nation of Israel at that time. Now, here's a few of the things that the Levitical priesthood did that is done away. Hebrews 9, then verily the first covenant had ordinances of divine service. I just want you to note that word because I'm going to come back to it. And a worldly sanctuary. Right? What does that mean? It was a sanctuary. It's not worldly in the fact that the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. This is a worldly sanctuary. It just means it was on the earth. It was physical. And there was a tabernacle made. So what's a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a tent. Right? So if you remember when God first made the tabernacle, it was a tent because the idea was this is not the permanent place where God's going to dwell. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth one day. So God made it like nomadic where the tent would move with them. They ended up making a temple. Why? Because David had the idea to make a temple for God. God told him, I never asked you to make a temple, but then he let David make it anyway. And that's why you say, is it a temple? Is it a tabernacle? It started off as a tabernacle. It started off as a tent. But they had to put up and take down and wherever they moved, they did it. And then David was the one that had the idea to make the temple, and then he had his son Solomon build it. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So a lot of these things are described in the Old Testament, and it just kind of gives you a picture of you know, what was in that tabernacle as, as you're working, walking through it. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer. It's like a bowl you know, with incense in it. And the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. So the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, remember that was that box that they kind of carry, the Levites carried from place to place. And on top of it, it, it describes... So what was inside this Ark of the Covenant? You even learn about what's inside it in, uh, in, in Hebrews. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna. So there was a pot of manna, which was the, the bread that fell down from heaven uh, in, inside the Ark of the Covenant. And Aaron's rod that budded, right? So that's how God showed that Aaron was chosen to be, you know, the priest. He, he had, they had all had all the tribes made a, a rod, and then Aaron's rod bloomed, and that was God's sign that was he was a chosen. And the tables of the covenant. So that's the two ten commandments, the tables of stone. That, they were inside the ark of the covenant too. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat. So these are these heavenly creatures with the wings that sat on either side, and this is, one of the, that, this is one of the cherubims, I believe, was Satan. Lucifer was one of these cherubims that was on the right side of God, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So it's saying this tabernacle represented being able to go into the presence of God. And back then, you know, the, the, the symbolism there was, well, you needed a mediator to go in first and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And, you know, the veil was there. We, we, people couldn't go into the presence of God. But, you know, and then, it, then it went to the temple with the, the veil. And when Jesus was crucified... Do you remember the, the, when he died, the veil was rent. So that was signifying now, because of Jesus Christ's death and burial and resurrection, we can enter into the holiest of all and come boldly unto the throne of grace, which was a figure for the time then present, verse 9, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So it's not, these were just all symbolic. That's what it's saying. This was a figure 
It was a shadow. These pointed to other things. And Paul is making this argument in Hebrews 9 because he's talking to Jews. He's writing to Jews, telling them why these things don't do what they believe them to do, not to fulfill us a spiritual thing. It was, six, it was um, a spiritual significance. And they were a shadow and a figure, right? Like a representation of the true, which was Jesus Christ. Which stood, verse 10, only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. Carnal means fleshly. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. Do you see how these were temporary, right? So there were services and laws and rules that were temporary up until a certain time. When? But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So you see, it's not that it's cherry-picking things you want to keep and not keep. It's that there were things to do with the Levitical priesthood that they are no longer there. And the short of it is, what, remember, what was the tithe given for in Numbers 18? He says here, You shall eat it in every place, ye in your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. So the tithe was commanded there to fund the Levites who worked in the tabernacle of the congregation. But today, there is no longer the law of the tithe, right? Because this is a law like Sabbath keeping and all these other ones that have been done away with that no longer apply in the New Testament. People will say here, um, they'll say, you know, well, they think, well, the tithe was given to the Levites and to the priests, and they'll say, like, well, it's like the bishops and deacons are like the new priesthood. Right? That's, what, that's what the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church think, right? That's why they have all those ceremonial things where they wear the hat and the rope because they're, they're getting that from the ceremonial priesthood and they go and they swing their incense and they do all that stuff because they believe still that it's a carry-on from this priesthood. But you need to understand that church leaders, bishops and deacons, are not the new priesthood. We are not the priests of the New Testament church. Who are the priests in the New Testament? It's all of us. It's believers. Right? Believers are the priesthood. First Peter 2, But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now people but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And we see here also in Revelation 1, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the people that argue for tithing in the New Testament and say tithing is like, you know, that's why you... You bring your you know, tithes to the storehouse and it's to fund the, the priests and the Levites. I can see that there's a similarity there. Obviously, there's a similarity to the tithes and the giving of God's people funding the workers who work the work of God, right? But don't get this idea that bishops and you know, deacons are priests and somehow they have more access to God than you do. No, we are all priests. We have our mediator, Jesus Christ. You have access to God just as much as I have access to God because we are all priests in the New Testament. Right? We are a royal priesthood. Now, what are some objections to the position that I'm arguing this morning, which is that the law of the tithe no longer applies in the New Testament? Well, some people will say, well, tithing existed prior even to Moses. So we'll just look at some of those examples and I'll give you some thoughts there that I don't think these are arguments for the law of the tithe being applicable in the New Testament, right? Even though some people tithe before even the law of the tithe was given in Moses. First of all, let's look at Abraham, right? We already touched on Melchizedek in Hebrews. Here's the actual story in Genesis 14, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedileoma and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is, king, which is the king's dale. So there's a, a war that Abraham and his men fought and it was known as the slaughter of the kings. 
And after this slaughter, they took the spoil from that battle, right? And this mysterious character, if you've read through your Bible, you just all of a sudden get to Genesis 14, and this mysterious character, Melchizedek, comes to meet Abraham. You learn more about him in Psalms and obviously explains who he is in Hebrews. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, different people believe differently who Melchizedek is. I believe Melchizedek is, is Jesus Christ, right? It's a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. He's the Word of God, um, and that's who he is. He's not just some other random man that represents Jesus Christ. He was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. We read in Hebrews that he gave him a tenth of the spoil. Now, from the technical definition of tithe, did he give him a tenth of something? Yeah, he did. Right? But then, is this Abraham keeping the law of the tithe? No, because Abraham didn't give a tenth of like, the increase of his land and sheep and all that stuff. This was a specific scenario where he had a slaughter of the kings and of the spoils, he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. Right? So not only is, you know, you can say, well, he gave a tenth, but another thought is, well, Abraham sacrificed animals as well. Abraham did a lot of things that we don't do today. So we can't just say just because Abraham did it, therefore it's commanded in the New Testament. We see him do something, we see the commandment of the tithe in the Old Testament, but it's done away with in the New Testament. Just because somebody does something, a precedent doesn't equal a commandment, just because we see somebody do something. And if we were to be consistent, like I said, Abraham also did offerings, burnt offerings and whatnot. But you don't see people arguing that we should still be slaughtering animals and offering up burnt offerings and whatnot. We recognize that these things have been done away with, right, with the New Testament. The other example, just so you have it in your back pocket and you have it in your, in your knowledge, Genesis 28, this is when uh, Jacob vows to give a tenth unto God. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto me. Now, no doubt here, Jacob is committing a tenth of all his belongings to God. But like I said, just because he did something, that doesn't necessarily mean it's commanded for the New Testament, right? So we can see here, yes, that's what Jacob did, but this is not God saying that his people must do it. When did that happen? In the Old Testament under the law of Moses, but like we talked about in Hebrews, this is something that no longer exists because the Levitical priesthood is no longer there and that's why the tithe was commanded. All right, now how does this compare to giving in the New Testament? Remember the title of the sermon is Tithing versus Giving. So we now know and understand what the tithe is. Well, what does giving in the New Testament look like? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 9 as Paul writes about it here in verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now let me ask you, if the tithe was still in effect in the New Testament, and it was, if you didn't pay the 10% to your church, right, then you were actually robbing God, and you were like under a curse. Can you honestly say that, like, I'm, I'm not giving this grudgingly or of necessity. I'm giving it out of, like, out of my own purpose in my own heart, right? So you can see that's very different in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you were obliged, it was commanded, you were robbing God if you didn't give that 10%, right? That's how the law of the tithe was. How does it work in the New Testament? Well, the New Testament is... We pay our taxes already, you know, more than enough, to the government. So when we give to a church, what is it? You are giving of the money that you have, that you have stewardship over. Obviously, we can say, well, God owns everything. But you decide how to use that money. Now, there is an obligation from God's people to fund the work of God. But he doesn't tell you how much to give. 
Right? It's up to you how much you give. Now, if you say, well, what's a reasonable percentage? People might say, well, the tithe was 10%. Maybe I'll give it 10% of my take-home pay. 10% I'll give to God's work, and 90% I'll keep to myself. But you see how that's a different calculation to the tithe, which is 10% of your revenue. That would be anything you take in, right? You know, without any deductions. So people have to decide for themselves. You know, it's a matter of your own conscience. How much you want to give. Right? And, it, and that's why the Bible says, hey, it's, it's according as he purposeth in his own heart. Hey, how much do you want to give? How much do you want to benefit the kingdom of God? And that's the principle we see here in verse 6. He says, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So this just comes down to, well, how much do you want to reap in terms of how much do you want to benefit God's kingdom. And later on in the chapter, we're not going to read it, but we see here, obviously, you know, the more you give to God's work, the more people can work in God's work, right? The more things... I mean, how many times have you seen churches, and, and thank God our church is not like this, and it never gets to this point, where, you know, they may... Everything's run down. You know, have you ever been to a church where just everything's run down? You know, the bishop's computer is like, you know, some old laptop... And nobody's like buying them a new one so that you can use it. They have like an old projector. It's like dim. And they, you know, they have like this old screen. Just like all this old stuff. And you say like, why is that? Well, it's because God's people are not consistently giving to the work of God so that God has some things to use to, for God's ministry. So this is why. It's like you, you reap what you sow in terms of what you give. If you want this church to succeed, you want to have workers. You know, you want, you want, you want a full-time bishop. You know, that's, this is where you reap what you sow. Right? So it's the same with equipment. Why, why are we able to have this equipment? Why can you sit here today and go, look, we can hire a nice building you know, with air conditioning and we have speakers and we have, you know, it's clear, everyone can see. Well, you reap what you sow. Right? You gave to the work of God and now the money can be used to not only serve you but to serve others who come and, and, and all that. And also, obviously, the more we have, the more we can help people as well. So you reap what you sow. You know, so many people, they expect bishops and deacons just to work for free. I don't know if you've ever seen that amongst, you know, uh, like the people you're, you're among. And they say like, oh, you know, they're doing charitable work, they just work for free. You know, not even charity workers work for free. You know, they, they, they need to get paid, they need to make a living. I mean, this is why you get, you know, I don't know if you've ever met, you know, bishops that just, you know, three services a week, working full time, and they burn out. Do you know what I mean? That's why you reap, you reap what you sow. It's like you want a bishop like that that burns out. You reap what you sow. You guys, you know, I'm trying to do it the smart way, just part-time, trying to keep, keep the, the work-life balance in check so I don't go insane. But, you know, that's, that's what you get. You reap what you sow. And unfortunately, a lot of bishops and deacons do burn out. And I remember when I was calling around uh, in churches um, and looking for a church, you know, before I pastored this church and whatnot, and, you know, some churches you ring because they're still advertised, but they're no longer in the ministry, right? Because people didn't give, they couldn't, couldn't keep it going, they had to go back to work, and it was too much for them. And I remember talking to this one guy, and it, seemed, it sounded like they were actually bitter at their congregation. You know, they were bitter at them, saying like, no, oh, they wouldn't support us, and so then they closed it down. And you think, you know, was that the right thing to do? Well, obviously there's always two sides of the coin where, you know, that person could have just kept burning the candle at both ends and just worked and worked with the, with the right frame of mind and that's what he should have done, right? He should have just done it for God and just done the right thing. But then you say, like, well, why does this happen? Well, congregations, they, they reap what they sow, right? If they don't get behind the people, it's like in any charity. If you don't get behind that charity, you can't really be upset when that charity no longer exists and there's no one to do it because, you know, that's just how the world works, right? It's, I know it's not always a nice topic to talk about with money, but that's just how the world works, you know, like money is how things, people contribute. They either contribute their time or they contribute their money and then that allows other people to contribute their time. And that's the same in the Levitical priesthood. They contributed their time to do the work of God and God made sure that they were taken care of. So that's how it works in the New Testament. You reap what you sow. First uh, Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, and there, that there be no gatherings when I come. So you can see in the Old Testament, tithe was collected up, it was brought to the tabernacle every year. 
Whereas giving in the New Testament, it's collected every week as the people gather and that there's always money to be used. And like Paul says, you know, he doesn't want a gathering, a special gathering when he comes. He just wants the church to always have funds and gather so that when he comes, it's already there. And as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. First, Corinthians, uh, First Timothy 5. So not only did it pay for the elders in Jerusalem, but we see here uh, the, tithe, well, the, the giving in the New Testament was also used to pay for people that needed it, like widows, and also to pay for the church workers. Verse uh, 16 in 1 Timothy 5. If any man or woman that believeth hath widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And there's even a movement amongst you know, conservative Christian churches that you know, bishops shouldn't get paid. And I just think it's, it's very, um, you know, obviously I'm talking from my point of view, but I just think it's not good for what I've seen previously, you know, in other churches where, um, you know, like pastors I've seen in other churches, like they really struggle, you know, and their cars run down and everything. And the, the congregation didn't even think to take care of their, of their bishop in that church and, to, and to, to provide for them, make sure they were provided for. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, Paul actually addresses this question because he was actually being accused as well of just doing things for money back then. So that's why in the Corinthian church, he actually refrained from taking a salary from them, from taking money from them, just to get rid of that accusation. But he addresses this issue of, hey, those who work for God ought to get paid from the giving from God's people. Now notice in 1 Timothy 5, we already talked about widows and bishops and elders in the church. And you see this phrase, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. He mentions this as well in 1 Corinthians 9. Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? So what is he saying here? He's saying that if you have a farm, isn't it reasonable that you eat of that farm? Right? If you raise a flock, isn't it reasonable that you drink the milk that that flock produces? He says, they, Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Now, so, so what is this saying? It's saying when the ox is treading out the corn, a muzzle is you put something over its mouth that it can't stop and just eat some corn as it's working. So God is saying, look, when the ox goes and treads out the corn, don't put a muzzle over him. If the ox wants to stop and eat some of the corn, let the ox eat the corn. And he's likening this to how it works in the Levitical priesthood and how it works today amongst God's people. He says, doth God take care for oxen? He's saying, did God write this law to not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn because he cares so much for cows? No, or for oxen? No, he says, no. He says, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we, so this is Paul talking to now the Corinthians, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He's saying, is that so bad that if he has imparted unto them this spiritual knowledge, these spiritual gifts, this spiritual information, all these things he's done for them spiritually, that he is able to benefit from them materialistically and to take care of his needs? He says, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power of you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And like I said, the context in Corinthians was they were accusing him of being a false prophet, a false apostle, and all these sort of things. So he was trying to remove that from the table. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? So this is where when people talk about tithing being similar to giving in the New Testament, they're right. There is a similarity between them in the sense that 
Those that worked in the tabernacle were supported by the tithes. Those that work in church are supported by the giving of God's people. Do, not, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live on the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Look, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So those are the similarities between tithing and giving. Right? Obviously, it's to support uh, God's people. In conclusion, so tithing versus giving. So what is the same when it comes to tithing and giving? Similarities are it's to support God's workers. Right? So the Levite tribe was put aside to do the work of God. Then you have church workers today, right? whether it's widows, bishops, and deacons. Those, that money is used to fund those workers because there is work to be done. It's the same in the sense that it's commanded, right? So giving is not optional, but the amount is up to you, right? So just like the law of the tithe was a commandment, we are also commanded to lay up in store, you know, as, every, as God has prospered us every week, and to, that's why churches take a collection, right? This is just part of how it works. This is where charities even get the idea. You say, why do charities do it? Well, because the church, I believe, is the very first charity. So it's commanded. That's where the similarities end. But what is different? Different is the amount you give. Right? So the t- law of the tithe was 10% of revenue, no deductions. But in the New Testament, how much do you want to give? How much do you want to reap? And so how much can you give? You know, some people, if, if you're living in poverty and you can't even afford to pay for your food, I'm sure it's okay to like not give to you're somebody that needs help from the church. Right? So you see how they're like, that person, you know, they don't have the ability to give. That's where the church needs to help them. Right? But if you're able to, you know, you're earning an income and you have, you know, you ought to be contributing to the work of God. I mean, sometimes it's a shame amongst God's people when you, you see like, you know, new mosque built here in Liverpool. New mosque built there. New mosque built here. And it's like, where are all the churches? Right, because God's people are t- too tight-fisted, right? But the Muslims aren't. Man, the Muslims, they, they, yeah, we're happy to give, right? And they have huge, you know, things like that. Now, I'm not saying that that's how money should be spent. All I'm saying is, you know, you can see that people that don't even know the truth are more generous than people that do know the truth. So the amount is different. Old Testament, New Testament. New Testament is it's up to you. How much you want to reap and sow. How much you want to give to God. How much treasure you want to lay up in heaven as opposed to lay up in earth. Who receives it is different. So back then, it is the Levitical, the, the Levite tribe. That 10% was given to them. They tithed on that. Now what about in the New Testament? You say, Victor, this giving that it does, must it come to the church? Hey, it would be great. I'd love you guys to support it and get behind it. But no, your giving does not only need to come to a church. You say, like, well, Victor, I give, you know, I support my church, but I also give to this charity. I help my friend in need over there. Like, this is all giving in the New Testament, right? So it's a command for us to be generous with our funds and to help people and to give and to give to different causes to further the work of God. Now, part of that is obviously supporting your local church to keep it going. But that's not the only receiver. Some people believe that, no, only your giving should be done to church and then the church gives. No. That's up to you, right? So it's, it's, it's up to you how people purpose in their heart, right? They give to what they believe are worthy causes. Uh, obviously, if you're here, you, I hope you believe this is a worthy cause, right? And the consequences are different, right? So with the Old Testament tithe, remember the consequence was you were under a curse. You're robbing God. Here, what are the consequences? Well, technically, if you give none, you just lay up less treasure in heaven. Maybe you're building less on your foundation. You're just reaping and sowing less. You'll be rewarded less for what you give. Right? So don't be, you know, understand that money is just a measure of your time. Right? When people volunteer for something, that's no different to giving to something. Right? So, so if you think money is just, how, how do you convert your, you know, time and energy into something that's tradable? That's all it is. So when you give, you can give in very different ways, right? When you give your time, that's also giving of your resources. And when you give money, it's all the same. So don't think, oh, it's just money or it's resources. Giving, you give, and then the more you give, 
the more you're going to reap spiritually, right? This is not the prosperity gospel where it's like the more you give, therefore your business is going to do better and you're going to get that promotion. That's not what we talk about reaping. So we're saying that if you give to a charity, the more that charity can do. That's what 1 Corinthians 9 talks about. Okay, so I hope you learned something there. I hope you learned the difference. I know it's a bit of a complex sermon, but a complex, uh, complex topic, but hopefully you learned something there this morning. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Uh, more of a teaching sermon this morning, Lord, but something that I think is important for us to distinguish between. So we give with the right frame of mind. So help us, Lord, to give cheerfully, to give purposefully, and uh, we thank you, Lord, that because of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you know, he is, we sort of paid that tithe, that, that fulfillment of that law. But Lord, I pray as well that you would give us a heart to want to grow your kingdom, to grow your ministries. And I pray, Lord, that we would not, you know, make money just for ourselves and for our own comforts and for our own lives. But Lord, we would truly have an eternal view of things that we'd lay up treasures in heaven, Lord, and we would use our funds and our resources and our time to further your kingdom. So we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.